Okay, so I hope you've just seen the, the previous talk, um, week 16, talk number one, which was about um, BAM configurations and the potential for robust niche modeling in under different configurations of the BAM. Um, in this talk, I just want to give you a bit more detail and a little bit more illustration, and I hope it'll make these ideas a little bit more accessible to you. Um, what I'm going to do is just probe into the GBIF data set, uh, or the GBIF, the data enabled by GBIF, um, and just going to look at a bunch of distributions of species uh, and talk about them in terms of BAM configuration. So let's, let's jump into this. Okay, so I'm gonna take the opportunity of, of uh, your time to go into a few examples of different BAM configurations using real world examples, uh, birds and mammals, mostly birds, uh, but just things where there's, there are uh, clear conclusions about BAM configurations, and I've already talked with you about what that implies as far as uh, niche modeling. So let, let's look at some examples. And remember, we had these, these four configurations. Um, we had kind of a partial overlap, which is what we've called classic BAM. We've had full overlap, which we could call all okay. We've had Hutchinson's dream, which is that everything is accessible, and so species distributional limits are set by abiotic considerations. And Wallace's world, where, where accessibility really sets the limits of species distributions. And those are all caricatures and extremes, and as you see, as you will see in this talk, um, the distinctions between them are not um, black and white. So first of all, let's look at some Wallacean species. This is probably the easiest set, uh, but let's just look at some examples. Here is um, a, a dove, uh, Ducula mindorensis. You can't see it, but there's one uh, place where it is found. And as we zoom in a bit, we can see it in two points, both on the island of Mindoro, hence its specific epithet, and if we zoom in still more, we can see it's known from two places. Uh, it obviously occurs in, in more than that, kind of across parts of the, of the island of Mindoro. But this is a species where um, my best guess, given, given uh, other Ducula, my best guess is that this species could range farther north, farther south, farther east, farther west. Um, more seasonal, cooler, warmer, uh, but it evolved on this island, and so it's on this island. So I think this is a great candidate for a, a Wallacean species. Now let's let's play around in the Philippines a little bit more. Uh, Mimizuku, Mimizuku gurnii is an owl, uh, really neat endemic genus of owl, and you can see it's found only on this southern island called Mindanao. Um, nowhere else, not even on the islands to which Mindanao was connected just 20,000 years ago. So Mimizuku is probably a Wallacean species and is probably um, pretty dramatically confined to one single present day island. Now, in contrast to that, also on Mindanao is Physedula basilanica. Now, Basilan is this island here, and you can see there's a record from Basilan. But you can also see it present on Samar and Leyte up to the north of Mindanao. And this kind of harks back to an, a concept of uh, Pleistocene aggregated island uh, complexes, sorry, pikes. Um, and this concept basically says, yeah, these are the current limits of the islands, but just at the last glacial maximum, global sea levels were 100 meters lower. And so any islands connected by shallow seas 
20,000 years ago were connected by land. And so here you can see an echo of that where the old island that we call Greater Mindanao all holds populations of this species. So in this case, another Wallacean species, certainly it can go farther north or south, but it evolved on Greater Mindanao and Greater Mindanao is a fine uh, hypothesis of its accessible area. Uh, and this is a species where the accessible area, I'm pretty sure, dominates um, the distributional potential of this species. Now let's, for another set of neat examples, let's go to the Amazon basin. So we're in Central South America and the Amazon River is this amazing stripe across uh, that region, dividing it into north and south. And then kind of like barbs on a feather, there are uh, these side rivers that come in both from the north and from the south. And one insight over the last half century, beginning with Jürgen Hafer and others, uh, one insight has been that these rivers structure the distributions of species very dramatically. So I'll show you a couple of, of uh, bits of research coming out of uh, the research group of Alexandre Aleixo. Um, um, here for the genus Malacoptila, which are puffbirds. And what I want you to see is that these different lineages are pretty strictly limited to different sectors of the Amazon basin um, and mostly structured by rivers, north and south of the Amazon. Here's another one. Um, let's go and look at another one here for an ant bird, Mermesiza hemimelina. Um, what you can see is this, this complex is only south of the Amazon. So right there you have uh, uh, a distributional limit set by a river. And then you can see again that they, the, they are limited to particular interfluvia, in this case, uh, quite small. But the point is that um, Amazonian biodiversity is pretty, pretty amazingly structured by rivers. And you can see quite clearly that um, M is going to be exerting a pretty uh, severe constraint on the distributions of these species. Okay, let's go on to a different um, configuration. Uh, let's look at something that might fit within the all okay category. Here's a, a species of bird that I studied in my dissertation work, uh, Aphylacoma insularis. And what you see is one big circle representing a lot of records, and then a few surrounding records. Um, here we're zooming in a bit, and you can see a couple records here on the mainland a bunch of records from an island, and then some offlying records. Well, everything that is not on the island is a mistake, either in terms of wrong or imprecise georeferencing or wrong identifications. Um, this is a species that's never been found off the limits of uh, Santa Cruz Island. It's a species with uh, pretty good um, mobility. So strongly flying bird. Um, and so my guess is that every inch of this island is uh, accessible to the species, but it's not off the island, even to go to the next island over, which I believe is Santa Rosa Island. Um, its distribution is structured by the limits of that island, which is where it evolved. And so this is another um, M-limited species, but in this case, at least in climatic terms, much of the, the island or all of the island would be habitable for this species. I'll come back to this point in a moment about this particular species. But first let's go on and look at some classic BAM species. And this is going to be where we're going to see a mix of um, barriers structuring the distribution of the species and also um, environmental conditions structuring the distribution of the species. 
And so here's a, a grackle, um, Quisculus major. Uh, and what I want you to see is what clearly doesn't get out um, off of the coast or to Cuba. Uh, but probably Cuba would be a, a pretty uh, habitable and, and appropriate place for it. Um, but then, especially if we zoom in a bit, you can see it goes inland a bit from the coast, uh, but there are no barriers in central Louisiana, for example, or, or uh, southern Georgia. Um, it's probably a matter of environmental uh, limitation. So we're seeing a mixture of um, effects of A and effects of M in structuring the distribution of this species. Another one, um, this is the mountain lion or puma. And what I want you to see is it's very broadly distributed in the Americas. Uh, there are a lot of these points at the infamous longitude zero, zero. We've talked about that before. You know that those are just missing values. But what I want you to see is pumas get around the Americas very broadly. Um, and they basically, probably are meeting up with some sort of climate determined limit here, maybe related to snowfall. And you also don't see it in, in the driest areas. Okay. Um, so there are climatic limitations, but then there are also, um, you know, it's only in the Americas. I'm certain the species would do fine if we were to introduce it to Asia or, or Africa or Australia but it's never been there, okay? So this is again a mix of M and A effects. So it's a classic BAM species. And finally, um, there are examples of things that we could posit to be Hutchinsonian species. Here's greater prairie chickens. And what I want you to see is that they are kind of limited to the central North America. Uh, I want you to see that kind of all around their distribution, there are not really barriers like rivers or oceans or mountain ranges. It just peters out. Um, and I just, you know, this is a species that's, it's probably got some elements of classic BAM in it, but it really is limited on all sides by uh, environmental considerations, I believe. So here's another um, example of a Hutchinsonian species, um, but a different sort, which is to say this is a species that has amazing dispersal abilities, and it has essentially had access to the entire world. Um, you can see from an old world origin, it spread out to all of the continents except Antarctica. And then probably most interesting, notice that it's all across the Pacific on tiniest and most remote islands that there are. And so this is a species where M is so large that I think we can at least trust that it's been able to get everywhere. I don't know about Antarctica, but essentially everywhere. And uh, what we're seeing here as far as its distribution is all set by environmental constraints and not by uh, constraints on dispersal. Okay, one final comment is that all of this, all of these comments about BAM configurations, they are all scale dependent. And that's a way of saying that they all depend on how fine or how coarse is your point of view um, when you inspect these distributional phenomena. Let's, let's pay a, a bit of attention to this. Um, at the coarsest scales, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's all Wallace's world, which is to say life evolved here and any species that we're studying is confined to Earth um, and is not on Saturn or Mercury or anywhere else. And that is simply a, a consequence of history. And so that sounds a lot like a, a Wallace's world configuration. When we come down and look at it like this, uh, this is going back to our, our greater prairie chicken example, 
um, it still looks kind of Wallace, Wallacean, which is to say this species is on North America. In fact, this genus and this lineage are, are confined to North America. Um, and so in that sense, there is at least a classic BAM dimension. But as we get in closer, we start to see, oh yeah, there are no barriers right around the distribution of this species. And so what I said to you earlier is that this is a Hutchinsonian species. And again, that is a scale dependent point. Uh, this is a species that is crucially dependent on tall grass prairie. And um, its extent out here to the east and formally, formerly out as far as uh, Massachusetts was all dependent on at least the habitat. So there's a biotic dimension even. And then we get to really fine scales and the distribution uh, of individuals at least may be a consequence of, of interactions completely. So again, we go from a Wallace's world to a classic BAM, to a Hutchinson's world, to a non-Eltonian noise world. And so all of these conclusions about greater prairie chicken are scale dependent. Another example I gave you was the, the, the island J. And I said to you, this is something that uh, the whole island is, is uh, habitable for the species. And in climate terms, that's certainly true. You know, the climate here and here and here and here, for one thing is pretty much the same. And for another thing is certainly all within the fundamental ecological niche of this species. But if I zoom in, I can find places that are ideal for this species. Like here we see this, this scrubby oak and a bit of pine forest. The species is perfectly happy there versus these, these areas here that are grassy and, and with low vegetation. And so again, it's all scale dependent. Santa Cruz Island at the level of, at the resolution of climate data is all habitable. But if we go into the you know, 10 square meters or one square meter, parts of the island are not appropriate for the Jays. So again, coming back to this point, remember that some of these configurations of the BAM should be off limits to a responsible niche modeler. But you do have the possibility of taking advantage of that scale dependence. In a Wallace's dream scenario or an all okay scenario, if you have the potential of increasing the spatial resolution, both of the environmental data and of the occurrence data, then you can shift from those configurations to classic BAM or Hutchinson's dream, where you can fit a model. So uh, just a few sum up considerations about BAM. Uh, first of all, as I showed you before in the previous talk, different configurations of the BAM diagram have implications for ENM outcomes. We frequently neglect B because we think about the Eltonian noise hypothesis. But even just A and M have several configurations that are different. All of those configurations are manifested out there in the real world of species distributions. And all of the, these conclusions about configurations are dependent on scale. So please, even if you have your species and you have your data, and you've got your question and you're all ready to sit down and run a model, think about the BAM. And if you are in a Wallace's world configuration, be honest with yourself and either don't do the modeling or find a way to increase that resolution and shift it into a, a classic BAM or a, a Hutchinsonian uh, scenario. Uh, it's not responsible and it's not appropriate and it's not good science to work in a situation where you will be analyzing noise and not signal. Okay, enjoy, and I will see you in the questions on Friday. Take care, everybody.